My name is Bob Ford, for those that don't know me. Uh, I'm on the Conservancy Board of Directors, and actually this is my second term with the Conservancy. First term was back in the 2004-2005 time frame, just before our capital campaign. And sandwiched between these two terms, I was delighted to serve as your development director responsible for raising funds for the Conservancy. And I know that many of you know me from that previous role, because when I was talking to you earlier this evening, I saw your hands instinctively going towards your wallets and pocketbooks to protect it. <laughs> well, no worries about this evening. We're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Land Conservancy. And to make the evening even more special, we're absolutely delighted to have the city of Rancho Palos Verdes join us as they celebrate their 40th anniversary. And thank you so much to the city for agreeing to co-host this event this evening. Now we're going to kick things off by showing you a video about what the Conservancy is about and what we're doing. But as you watch the video, I want you to think back to something that happened eight or nine years ago, just as we were about to embark on the capital campaign to raise the funds to purchase the 400 acres in the Portuguese Bend area. You know, at that time, the question we were asked the most was, it was something like this. Look guys, I love the ideas of you guys saving the open space. I want to contribute to your capital campaign. But if this conservancy thing doesn't work out, can I get my money back? <laughs> well, let's take a look at the video and see if uh, that answers any questions. More than 25 years ago, our peninsula communities chose sanctuary over sprawl and natural open space over bulldozers, launching the Land Conservancy on its mission to preserve land and restore habitat for the education and enjoyment of all. In this short time, the Conservancy, with the strong support of the community, local governments, and agencies, has successfully preserved 1,600 acres of open space on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. The Conservancy's vision is to protect and steward large areas of natural open space where visitors may enjoy peaceful solitude, children and adults can learn about the natural environment, and native plants and animals can thrive. Throughout its 25-year history, the Conservancy has worked cooperatively with four cities where preserved lands are located, Rancho Palos Verdes, Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills Estates, and San Pedro in the city of Los Angeles. With the support of hundreds of committed volunteers, the Conservancy's stewardship team has restored more than 170 acres of native habitat in local preserves, protecting rare and threatened native species such as the California gnatcatcher and the Palos Verdes blue butterfly. Each year, the Conservancy's native plant nursery propagates more than 60 different species and plants over 20,000 seedlings for these restoration projects. Today, thousands of adults and children visit the preserves every year to learn about the land and its history and to explore the natural wonders of these wilderness areas. Visitors have access to more than 40 miles of trails for recreation, enjoying hiking, horseback riding, and biking. To enhance this experience, the Conservancy maintains trail systems, posts interpretive signage, and makes trail guides available for the public. Volunteer naturalists, historians, and geologists lead monthly guided nature walks, welcoming thousands of residents and visitors through the preserves and at two nature education centers at White Point Nature Preserve in San Pedro and at George F. Canyon Preserve, owned by Rolling Hills Estates. The Conservancy takes special pride in its education and outreach programs connecting the community with our special landscapes. Through elementary school programs, more than 25,000 students have learned about local natural history, geology, and native habitats. Many of these students are from disadvantaged schools engaged in conservation education tied to the California State Standards for Science curriculum. The Conservancy could not have come this far without your support. Thank you for making a difference in the community. Looking to the future, the Conservancy will continue to serve our community by helping people to appreciate and enjoy preserved land through volunteering and educational opportunities. 
It will motivate children to explore the natural sciences. It will restore scarce native coastal vegetation and revitalize the habitat for endangered and rare wildlife species. And it will uphold conservation agreements that keep our open space preserved for public use in perpetuity for future generations. The Conservancy has big dreams. Dreams are what motivate people to tackle forces like conserving land and inspiring our children, and we have no shortage of ideas about how to make these dreams a reality. The Land Conservancy looks forward to working with you to develop the knowledge, courage, and vision of our future, and our success hinges on your support. This is the power that you have, the power to change and to inspire, the power to make our community into champions of the place that we love. presenters to be uh, as brief as possible and uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, after the speeches we'll probably wrap up around about 7 or 7 15 and there'll be uh, dessert and coffee available and we should have everyone on the way home by 7 30. So without further ado and before I go over my allotted time uh, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. Uh, he's a renowned local architect and he has his own architectural firm He's been on the Conservancy's board for a dozen years, I think. And he's uh, in the second year of his two-year term as the president of the Land Conservancies. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, please welcome Bruce Beesman Simmons. Thank you, Bruce. We're going to hear a lot of thank yous this evening, and that's most appropriate. And I'm also realizing that Bob is a very difficult, difficult act to follow, but that owl <laughs> I, I should probably get up now. <laughs> so, I would begin, I'd like to begin introducing uh, members of the City Council who are here from the City of RPD. Uh, Mayor Susan Brooks is here. <laughs> Brian Campbell. Anthony Visitich, and Jerry Dehovic. And from the City of Rolling Hills City Council, Alan Lay. And there are also, I'm going to go a little off script here, there are people here who are on the original founding board. Marilyn Litvak, uh, David Benz, Bill, uh, David came over here, I'm sorry, but very early. Bill Ader, of course. Uh, is there anybody here who I missed from, from those way early days? All right, wonderful. So the thousands of people, organizations, art colony, foundations, businesses who supported the Conservancy over the last 25 years. But they can't be here in person. So I'm going to do something that's a favorite from my, my, my home country. My dad always used to make a proposal toast to absent friends. And along with that, uh, a shout out for Terry Hack, who, who is ill and unable to be here. Uh, she was recently awarded honored by the PV Chamber of Commerce with the Matt Burning Excellence in Business Award. So please join me in a shout out for absent friends and Terry Hack, get well soon. All right, Silver and Sage, our 25th anniversary. Cities, 40th anniversary. It was 100 years ago that the Vandalus did the, did, arrived and purchased the land in, in Palos Verdes. Lots of, lots of anniversaries. Many of you worked on the forming of the city and your supporters of the Conservancy. There's, a, there's an obvious congruity between these two entities, since both of them are founded on the ideas of preserving the character and the quality of life here on the peninsula. The city led the way, of course, but 
has been tremendously supportive, especially over the last 15 or so years. Without you, I'm trying to catch your various eyes around here, past and former council members, without you we couldn't have achieved so much. It's really great. But where do we go from here? What are we going to do? We're, 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 in a way, we're just getting launched. Because we really are in this for the very long term. We talk around the boardroom table, the 50-year commitments we have. And I frequently imagine, what's it going to be like in 500 years? So with your support, we worked hard, achieved a lot, learned a lot. And these open spaces have become an inseparable part of the quality of life here on the peninsula. The PD Nature Preserve is established, and we hope to continue to add to it over time, of course, but our immediate focus is on restoring the native habitat. Over the next 25 years, we look forward to continuing our track record of exceeding expectations. We're working to increase our financial stability, expand our outreach and education programs, and we'll continue with our science-based habitat restoration work. So that 25 and 50 years from now, even 500, when those red-tailed hawks that I love to watch soaring and circling are out there, they look down and they see huge swaths of perfectly re restored native habitat, rich and diverse and thriving. <laughs> oh, what a sight that'll be. <laughs> so, all right, thank you all very much for sharing this anniversary with us, with your continued support, and our collective future will be assured. Together we do really good work, thank you. And I'm now going to call on Mayor Susan Brooks to come and say a few words. Thank you, Bruce. It is so great to be here. Hey, was that an awesome video or what? Um, th so this is our 40th anniversary and this is your 25th. How cool is that? I mean, we are really, really blessed to be living in this wonderful city, which I call paradise. And we all call Palos Verdes, Rancho Palos Verdes in particular. Uh, you know, in 1973, our city's founders put together the general plan. And that was meant to be, and it is, a living and breathing document. And at its core, it serves a solid foundation of governance in order to preserve our semi-rural environment amid this concrete laid in Los Angeles. So I'm just going to bring you back 20 years, because in 1993, we actually created the vision statement that we use today. And I actually was mayor at that time as well. It's a lot of coincidences this year. There are six factors that have to do with our vision statement. And I, I'm just going to briefly run through these so that you know. Our vision statement was that we would provide a safe community where citizens can enjoy their prosperity and community amenities without, the, without fear for their safety. Number two, that public and private property would be maintained in a manner compatible with aesthetic settings of Palos Verdes. Number three, that we would have a sound community economic base to be developed and maintained. And number four, as part of that economic base, the city would provide opportunities for development of quality recreation facilities. And probably number six, the one you're most concerned with and the most the reason most of you are here today has to do with oh wait a minute not number five first um high customer satisfaction based on all the use of city services hello staff you may all take your applause now <laughs> And um, finally, the commitment to maintaining open space and public access in a manner that will not harm critical resources. So with that, you know, it, it is, I want to thank personally Bill Ayler, who in 1988, when I was just getting on the Planning Commission in my 30s, 
and now I'm only in my 40s, so what's the difference? But, you know, you still look as young as you did then, and whatever with me, but um, really to thank you so much for um, really having this vision. Um, it means a tremendous amount to me because um, personally speaking, I moved here with my family in 85 and the reason we moved here was when I rounded that bend on south coming up from San Pedro, originally from Long Beach. We were moving here from Arlington, Virginia. I was just looking for a place without concrete. I couldn't stand it. I was like, where can we go? And there is no green anywhere. And as soon as we rounded that bend, my heart just sunk. I was just like in heaven. And I said, this is it. I don't care where else there is, this is it. And we did make this place our home and we raised our children here. And I'm proud to tell you that my two children who came to love the natural resources that we offered here in the peninsula. At the time we had marine land. And you know, you could do a lot more with marine land than just um, go and watch a whale show. You could feed the six sea animals and you could take care, you could feed the koi fish, you could take care of um, you know, the, the actual marine mammals that were in the infirmary. And we did that regularly, and we regularly were able to participate through Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and everything else. The things that you have here on Palos Verdes that they don't have anywhere else. So I would just say that I, my children have definitely benefited from this natural environment, which is really critical, I think, to development of, as a developmental factor in the growth of our children in their formative stages. It's crucial. And it inspired my children so that they are both now contributing members to society whereby they are each in environmental sciences. My son is a fish biologist for the Jamestown tribe in Squim, Washington on the Olympic Peninsula where he absolutely loves what he does and he couldn't believe he could ever get a job doing what he loves to do, <laughs> fish. And he is also um, a, a forest hydrologist, so he went to his master's at UW for forest hydrology. And he is so passionate about the outdoors, he said, I will never do what my father did, which was be an attorney. He said, I will, my desk will be the front of the whole forest. And he said, this is my desk when he takes me out to, to walk with him on where he works. I mean, how fascinating is that? And then my daughter, Meredith, um, she, is, um, she went into aquaculture. And so she now works with aquaponics. And she develops these programs in Hawaii. And she, she corresponds between here and Hawaii. So she lives in both places now. But she's working with the Oceanic Institute and the Center for Tropical Culture. And so what she does is create these wonderful videos and promotional works so that we know that what we're gonna be eating in the future in the form of fish is gonna be healthy fish. And it's not gonna be farmed fish that is fish that is farmed and, and created on, on foods that are not sustainable and not good. And it is all about sustainability. So I'm just really, I have to say, I mean, I can give some credit to my father-in-law because you know he had a boat up in Washington. He took them out crabbing a lot. But the bottom line is they grew up here, and I, I really do think this is something that we are so fortunate to have that a lot of other people will, frankly, you know, be lucky enough to come to Point Vicente Interpretive Center where we are right now to get the same thing and just a smidgen of it. So we're really blessed. Um, the uh, working partnership, though, between the Land Conservancy and the city has been so crucial. And we are so appreciative of this model of success that you just demonstrated in this video. So through this collaboration between the Land Conservancy and the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, we've been able to, effective lever to effectively leverage public funds and community support to build something greater than what we would have achieved only through either nonprofit or government sources alone. What a unique, unique way to actually co-mingle something that's going to benefit the future 
This is not about us here. It is about future, future generations. So because we're blessed to live in this paradise, and, and my goal is to keep it that way, and I'm sure yours is too, together we can maintain this pristine environment for generations to come, and that, ladies and gentlemen, will be our legacy. And you should be proud of that. So we have a city proclamation here, and I'm not going to read it, but I am going to tell you that it, it does proclaim to the Land Conservancy on your 25th anniversary to thank you and acknowledge what a successful endeavor this has been thus far, and we look forward to more creative activities and more preservation in the future. Thank you, Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen. Now, this is a kind of a difficult thing. Uh, next person I am going to introduce uh, doesn't need any introduction. Uh, but without his leadership, without his foresight, without his pioneering ability, there would have been no conservancy. And before he corrects me, I want to point out that we also have to acknowledge his wife, Barbara, who is such a major force in getting this conservancy going. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, founder of Conservancy, the President Emeritus, and thank goodness, current board member of the Peninsula Land Conservancy, Dr. William Bill Ayler. Well, thank you. You know, you, it's one of these things where you know you step off on a on a path, and you never know where it's going to lead you. And I think uh, after 25 years, it's 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 just really heartwarming to see uh, see what's happened, in, uh, you know, in our community and how successful we've been. And I think a lot of people here help. So I'll, I'm going to mention a little bit about that. Um, but first, I just want to say that I just want to say what Susan Brooks has, has uh, said is basically how. I got into this business as well. Uh, Barb and I moved here in 1974 I, when I was at Purdue and got my PhD there. And coming out here, people said, uh, you know, if you're going to go to Los Angeles area, you've got to, you've, the only place you can left to live where there's any open space is Palos Verdes. And so we came straight to Palos Verdes when we drove out here, and, um, and we loved it here. We, uh, uh, we used to hike all the hills, and a lot of the development that you see at the top of the hill now wasn't here at that time. And uh, I got on the planning commission in, in um, oh, I guess, 1980-ish, I guess, and was on there for about seven years. And one of the things that I, you know, I, I always felt that you, know, you could see this, the area getting smaller where we could hike. Uh, the, the ranch got developed, and Wallace Ranch got developed. And those areas where they used to see uh, red-winged blackbirds flying all over the place, we were, we were missing that. And um, so I, I actually ran for city council a couple of times in, in uh, Rolling Hills Estates. I didn't get elected, which was a good thing. <laughs> because it, it actually gave me the time to go off and do something else, which was uh, uh, something I learned on the, when I walked that the city. Uh, basically, I asked people, uh, you know, about the open space and what do you think? That, you know, are you concerned about the fact that that's going to be going away? And, and of course, I heard testimony on the city council on the planning commission when I was there about people uh, saying, "Gee, we understand people have a right to develop their property, but isn't there a way where we can preserve it?" And I asked people about that, and I found that a lot of people shared my concern and these other people's concern about the fact that we were losing open space. So I talked to the city staff in uh, Rolling Hills Estates and basically asked them, "Is there a way for a local community to actually set up an organization like the Nature Conservancy?" that could preserve land, a group that was non-confrontational, that just would do, would buy land from willing sellers, and uh, could we do that? And so um, they said, yes, there is. I, and so they said, talk to Trust for Public Land. So I actually flew somebody down from Sacramento to come down and give a talk. This was in the old library in, in uh, Peninsula Center. And uh, put a little squib in the newspaper, uh, inviting people to come to this talk. And uh, I was surprised we had about 120 people that showed up. And uh, so she gave a great talk and talked about setting up a nonprofit group and how other communities had done that. And uh, we sent a little sign up sheet around, and we had a number of people sign it up. And uh, I think, uh, Marilyn, did you sign that? Yes. Marilyn lived back, back here, was on our first board. And uh, so we actually had about a.
And uh, so we actually had about a dozen, 15 people who signed up, and we had a number of meetings, and you know, the conservancy got, got sort of formed that way. And just as a little bit of background, you know, it, after I set this up, you know, my plan, I was busy at work. I had working on satellites and things, and I didn't, really didn't have time to do this, but, so I was, but I realized that uh, I, this wasn't going to happen if I didn't do it. And so uh, I was talking with the bar boss on, on McBride Trail one day, and basically told her, I said, you know, this is, it looks like a lot of people are interested, but I don't see anybody stepping up to do it. And so I asked her permission, and she gave it to me. <laughs> I don't think she knew at the time, but <laughs> and neither did I actually. But <clears throat> so, um, but anyway, we got we, we got that started, and and uh, just as a little a couple of interesting events along the way. And one of the first things we did was we went to meet Barry Hahn. You in the city may remember Barry Hahn. He owned uh, about four hundred and some acres, I guess, in uh, in the Portuguese Bend area. And uh, we asked him, uh, and told him what the land conservancy was. He took me a tour on some of the areas that he developed, which is really what I what, what wanted to see. And, um, but um, I told him that we were, you know, I just asked him how much did you want for the property because we would like to buy it. Anybody want to guess? 250 million. Now I'm happy to say <laughs> that some. Some year, oh, and by the way, it was interesting. He actually, uh, the LA Times did an article on the formation of the Conservancy right after we got started. And the interview Barry Hahn after we'd gone down there, and he said, Well, you know, they're very nice people, but they don't have any money. And, which is a very true statement. We had very little money. And Marilyn was our first treasurer, and she was telling me just a few minutes ago that, you know, that when she, we had $4,000 in the bank. For our <laughs> Thanks, change. So, um, so but I'm happy to say that uh, you know some years later we were actually very fortunate. We got bigger and we actually found the money from a number of things that we worked in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes to actually acquire his property at a price much less than 250 million. So that was nice. Uh, let's see. Okay, and oh, well, I might one thing I might want to do is I. You know, I, I work a lot, a lot of the people here were instrumental in getting this organization going over the years. Marilyn was, was on the, our original board and other people were, David Benz stepped up and helped. But I'd like to ask uh, all those people who've been on the Conservancy Board are on it now with this just stand and be recognized. Because you guys have been here. For the formal stuff, I invite you to go talk to some of those people and, and thank them for all they did. And just a couple other little things. Um, one of the things that, I, you know, as Barry, Barry Hahn said, we didn't have any money, but right shortly after we were we got started, um, I got a call from a, one of our supporters who was at a, I think it was a Rancho Palos Verde City Council meeting, and said that this, uh, there's a landowner down here at, at, a, at the meeting, you ought to come down and meet him. You know? So we were trying to meet the landowners and such, and that was a good thing. And so I did. I went, went down and introduced the Conservancy and, and I told him what we were trying to do. We were like the Nature Conservancy and such. And he basically said, you know, I really like the Nature Conservancy. Maybe I'll donate you some, donate some land. And here we had no money, but that was a very good thing. Uh, and, that, and, and by the way, he also said that we will time this such that it can really help your organization develop and grow. That was Ken Zuckerman. Ken is here somewhere. <laughs> They worked with his family to uh, E.K. Zuckerman family, I guess, to donate uh, about 20 acres of uh, property, which is now the Lonada Canyon Preserve, and uh, so that was our first acquisition. And then, fortunately, after that, we didn't need to ask for money over the years, uh, generally speaking, because we were able to work with the cities, and uh, there was bond acts out there that we could tap for doing that sort of thing that each of you contributed to, but didn't know that. That was very nice. And, uh, and so. So we were able to tap those, and we got a number of the properties by working with that. In some cases, the landowners, most were developers, I guess, but actually donated money back to us to help us do the habitat restoration stuff there, which was very nice. But then um, it basically happened that we needed to um, start raising money, and and uh, oh, just one other significant event I'll mention. And um, so we had a number of people who basically stepped up to help that really don't didn't get much recognition. Uh, matter of fact, I was, one of the first meetings we had was at the, uh, not meeting, but I introduced this, this organization to the public at the library again. And there was an individual in the back who was very quiet and didn't say anything. And then after the meeting, he came up and said, you know, I'm not very good at politics, but I'd really like to support you. So I'm going to stay in the background and, and do that. And so he did. And he was with us, helped us for years. And then on my 50th birthday, the birthday we had a party. 
And he basically stood up and says, I, I just want to uh, make a little statement here. And he got up and basically said that um, he, he wanted to make a donation that the organization was very pleased with that. And he gave us the largest donation that we received at that time. And that was Mike Sicoria. So, and Mike's wife is here. <laughs> One of the things we're always look, looking to do was to um, find new ways of getting recognition uh, out in the community. And uh, we were out doing a nature walk uh, exercise and we met an individual who was out uh, doing some painting and we got to talk to him. Turns out he was an artist who worked where I work at the Aerospace Corporation. And, and uh, so uh, he said, well, maybe we could set up something here where the artists can do something to, to benefit your organization because we, you know, we do this plein air painting and we really thought it counted in the The uh, a special exhibition on plein air paintings, and it basically highlighted the open space and natural beauty of the hills of Palos Verdes. And over, we had a number of, uh, that, was, that was back in 1997. I think we were all getting older, I have to say that. But, uh, but anyway, they had, uh, these artists painted, I'm guessing, hundreds of uh, paintings. And uh, they donated a portion of the sales to the Conservancy, and that was really helpful to us. But it also brought additional recognition to the organization and to the natural beauties and things we were trying to preserve. So that was very nice. Um, and I just want to conclude by saying that uh, the next the next speaker I'm going to introduce was one of the three artists that helped get put on that first first show and has been a principal in all of the shows we've had. He's just done fabulous work and uh, has practiced his artistic skills doing stuff in Palos Verdes and Kingdom. Well, thank you, Bill. It's an honor to be here representing the Pushy Bend Artist Colony. Um, uh, years ago, when a lot of us, I kind of represent the kids on the hill, I think, during the 50s and early 60s, and a number of us and most of the members of the colony, uh, we grew up together, and as you know, we've been friends since we were kids together. And uh, we all seem to gravitate towards the arts as kids and we kind of kept our friendship because we had that bond of the art. So years ago, I think like Bill just mentioned, uh, he ran into Rick on the trail and, and Rick was out painting and uh, uh, Rick called me and said, hey, you know, is there something we can do here? Because ever since, I mean, if you go over, you know, and see some of the paintings of ours at Karamea, uh, you'll notice that there's some pencil sketches in the niches uh, down the hallways and some of those pencil sketches well all of them Rick and I pretty much started doing when we were in high school here uh, in PV because on Saturdays we get together and go out to uh, the Ishibashi's farm or some of the open space because as kids when we first moved up here uh, from in Rick's case Westchester and myself Inglewood uh, we couldn't believe our eyes when we first came onto this peninsula and got, you know, for me, driven down to Mallory Cove School, and I thought, oh my God, there's an ocean out there. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget, you know, being 10 years old and going down to the tide pools and what an impact that had on, on myself and I know Rick and, and Amy and everyone and Steve and, in the colony. So I think what happened was Rick and I then in high school said, gosh, you know, this is so beautiful. And already we had started to understand the value of beauty in our lives, right? And, and beauty has a value. It has a value for all of us personally and as a community. And I think uh, what transpired was a natural growth uh, for, uh, for us as friends and artists is we would find ourselves wanting to get together, going out there and trying to capture some of the beauty that, and some of the impact that we felt on the emotional level when we first moved here. And we were always saying, God, this will probably be gone, or this is going to disappear. You know, let's put it down, you know, now. And we've been doing that ever since uh, we were kids. And so uh, when Bill and Rick ran into each other on the trail, it was a perfect fit, I think. And, uh, for us to kind of come together and formally form the Portuguese Bend Artist Colony and to kind of focus our attention, focus our efforts 
on, in a, in a nutshell, bring it, bring it to a point where when you put it on canvas and we see the beauty on canvas, all of a sudden we'll take ownership of our own area. Right? And that was the idea. If you could walk in and go, oh, I know that area, or I know that spot, right? All of a sudden, it becomes a part of you, right? And then all of a sudden, you take a stand and you stand up and, and uh, fight for those areas that you think are, are a part of you as well. So I think that's kind of the foundation and that's kind of the way it all started. Yeah. And uh, we did our um, first show and I think it was um, uh, Rick and Amy Sidrain and myself and uh, we uh, talked to the library in Malga Cove, and the library wasn't so sure, you know, what, what do you mean an art show? When I said, well, yeah, this was originally an art gallery, right? And they said, well, we have brownies, and we have bluebirds in here, you know, for meetings, and, you know. And I said, well, we can work around that. Well, how long do you want this show to be? And I said, well, a month. Well, a month? No, we can give you a day, or two days. Right? And so we said, well, we kind of like to do it for a month. Well, I just don't see how that could be done. So we ended up um, making all the walls, making everything ourselves, painting them, and then we hung the show. We had the opening, but just the three of us at that time. And then every night, uh, either Rick or Vicki or myself or Steve, we would drive out there at 11 o'clock at night and we'd take the whole show down, right? And put it out in the hall so they could have the brownie meetings the next day. And then we'd go back after the brownie meeting, rehang the whole show, you know, and sit out there and wait for the meetings to end. And then we'd get back up, take, you know, take them back in, set it up. And so it was back and forth for a month, right? And so I think after that month, the, uh, library had such a wonderful response and I think they had like 1200 people come through that first year so uh, they said wow well you guys are kind of you're really serious about this <laughs> and so then they started working with us a little bit more and so then we were able to move forward and then the next year Steve and uh, two other friends uh, uh, had the exhibition and those shows were primarily just for education I mean we weren't thinking they'd be for sale, it was an exhibition, just to show people the, the love and passion that we felt for the peninsula. So, as one thing led to another, and then 14 shows later, and you know, it's just going on and on, and it's been a real pleasure, and it's been a real honor. And, um, you know, we, we plan to continue for many years, you know, we just had to take a break. <laughs> you know, so, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and the Portuguese Bend Artist Colony. I can tell you how much we appreciate what you've done for us through the years. It's meant a tremendous amount to the Conservancy. Now, uh, there, uh, there's someone out here that symbolizes, I think, the deep love and affection that we have for the preserves and a commitment to passing it on to future generations. It's our next speaker. For nearly 60% of the time that the Conservancy has been in existence, this person has led nature hikes and introduced thousands of kids to the natural world on the peninsula. Uh, thanks to him, I can't walk the trails and pass an Artemisia bush without thinking about it as cowboy cologne. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our third grade education program manager, and much, much more, John Nieto. In 1963, I noticed there was a plaque uh, in Long Beach near the Breakers Hotel, and uh, it mentioned the Nieto family uh, setting a boundary there for their ranch uh, back in the old days. And as my dad, we were related to those people. He says, well, they're, they're sort of like uncles. Said, okay. And uh, later on, I found out that these uncles uh, were soldiers together on the Gaspar Bartola expedition in 1769 and uh, opened up California, Alta California, it was called. Uh, three of the uh, scouts, the uh, leather jackets, the Soldados de Cuero, 
were uh, frontier scouts, and uh, they were three of those gentlemen were the first dons of uh, Alta California, and uh, this uncle was one of them. Uh, there was uh, the owner of the uh, Verdugo ranch of 36,000 acres, and that was uh, Jose Maria Verdugo. He was a leather jacket scout. And then there was a uh, fellow named Dominguez, Jose Dominguez. Uh, he took about 75, 76,000 acres. And in my family, they were, they were corporals. And in, in California history, yes, they were corporals. Uh, but the next gentleman uh, was a sergeant in my family, although California history still says he was a corporal. Uh, was, uh, Manuel Perez Nieto, and uh, when he requested the King of Spain through uh, uh, the governor at the time uh, to uh, give him also some, some land here in this dry habitat, uh, they gave him 300,000 acres. Uh, but Manuel uh, had it shrink up a little bit when the, uh, the priests of the San Gabriel Mission thought it was just a little too close for comfort. And so they, they took 100,000 acres away, but uh, still had a, a good piece of land. And, I find myself buying just one small lot at a time now. <laughs> uh, we share a lot of that history with uh, our third graders. Uh, they like to hear about the fennel being brought for medicine by the Spaniards and uh, the Indian use of cowboy cologne. Uh, they really are open to uh, all sorts of interesting stories. Uh, I like the kids who uh, I find in the market sometimes that recognize me and. Uh, uh, they point to themselves and they say, it's me, it's me. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> we, uh, we've taught that almost 20,000 children in our third grade program now. Uh, I have 15 dedicated uh, people, ladies and gentlemen, some are here, uh, helping me uh, bring what uh, turns out to be a, a bigger message than we thought we would originally bring. Uh, the message of stewardship and uh, keeping our, our homes uh, as comfortable, but uh, still finding time to be outside and keeping the outside world that we own one way or another comfortable too. Uh, reminds me of a story where I had uh, a third grader. Uh, we, we eat uh, just about everything on my uh, walks that we find edible, and Shaw over there recognizes that. Uh, <laughs> We let, a, we let a hike uh, for some children, but the kids are, uh, are like little sponges and they, uh, they accept just about everything that we give them. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, I didn't think I'd be in the position I am now for volunteering with the Land Conservancy, but sort of grew into it. And it's one of those things like, like I said, Mr. Aylor, uh, you don't find a person that's going to step up and take that job, so you sort of fill it in on the fly, well, you're good for a little while. Yeah. So it's been um, uh, 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you all for, for helping the Conservancy and, and giving us uh, the beauty that we have here and still able to give it to our kids. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, invite our director. There you are. Hi, Andrea Bona. Thank you. So what a milestone, 25 years. Um, it's been incredibly inspiring to sit through and listen to these stories throughout this night and to reflect on all of what's been accomplished. Um, but our job is not done. So I don't know if that's a hooray for our staff or a oh, darn for all of our terrific staff that are sitting in the audience, but definitely our work is not yet done. Um, some of the things that we're currently working on are incredibly important and we do need continued support throughout the community. We are currently in collaboration with the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to finalize some very important conservation easements on the southern portions of land throughout the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. These agreements are really important, so we're so grateful for everyone that goes into environmental studies, but we're also grateful for those that go on to become attorneys to help us with these very complex <laughs> agreements. And we're looking forward to them being finalized because that really will be something that ensures the longevity of the protection of these coastal landscapes. You know, another specific collaborative item with RPV is, you know, some potential land acquisitions, maybe near Montanaga Drive. We're exploring that right now. And if appraisals line up with, with some of the property values, possibly some additional lands to be conserved. So there might be some nice news in the future to be had in, in those regards as well. 
it's important for the Conservancy to be here and to be strong um, and to thrive. Um, we, many of us heard and know about the landslide that happened at White Point about a year and a half ago. And so we're engaged in those conversations as well. And while the future of the road remains uncertain, it's, it's important that we're involved and um, we look forward to seeing how all of that turns out. We're doing some nice work at White Point at the moment and we'll be restoring some of the areas where they needed to do some drillings. Um, but even after all of these conservation easements are finalized and maybe additional land, lands added, our work is still not done. What remains? Um, I wanted to kind of reflect on an uh, interesting analogy one of our board members, Cassie Jones, made at a strategic retreat where she said, I think it's important for people to recognize and to share the message that we did invest in a large capital investment in these lands and this nature preserve. But it's sort of like we bought a house and parts of it are like a fixer-upper. And we do need to spend some time restoring these landscapes to get them to a higher ecological value. And that's something that we're, we're doing and we've got such talented staff and all of the volunteers that participate most weekends um, of the year to really help these preserves to become all that they can be. In addition to that, <laughs> The conservation easements, so these pieces of paper, these easement deeds that run with the land, they need us, they need the Land Conservancy to be here to hold them and to uphold them, to you know monitor boundaries, to check that the conservation values are being upheld. And that again requires us to be strong now and into the future, to be here on the peninsula with, with staff and volunteers participating in those efforts. So it's just, I can't underscore that enough about how important that is. And so that is our future. This is our preserve that's all being built together. And we look forward to working with you, our community and our local businesses, our local state and federal governments, because it all plays a role as we build together. And as it was said in the video, our success does hinge on your support. Everyone here in this room and everyone that couldn't be in this room tonight really all makes up the conservancy. It's, it's sort of like, I mean, even on the cellular level, nothing is in isolation. So we work together just like the ecosystems and the preserve do. So you are our ecosystem, you're a part of that. We really can't continue without you. And so it is the power that you have in your choice, and we, we appreciate when you choose us for your philanthropy. We appreciate when you choose us for your volunteerism, whether it be with your hands or your creative ideas or your um, service on our board, et cetera. It's, it's very inspiring to work with such an inspired community. And really, you're helping to sustain us. So I mean, in closing, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been a part of these past 25 years, and please, um, I hope that you continue to support us into our many tomorrows, and um, thank you all so much. Um, well, we have an official visitor here. We do have an official yeah. visitor, and she was asked to yeah. help us out. were advised before we started that they were supposed to limit their speeches to a certain amount of <laughs> Well, uh, apparently we forgot that rule. So I need to speak to the following people. Uh, Bruce Beesman Simmons, Bill Aylor, Mayor Susan Brooks. <laughs> And we haven't forgot John Nieto. Can you please come up here, please? Be good. Be kind. Be kind. Be kind. Are, are, are you really gonna get this people a citation or something?
to a video that's been produced by RPV TV. Um, we're specifically grateful, of course, to RPV TV, but also to Mark Dotty um, for his talents in creating this. It's a preview video that they're preparing for RPV's 40th. So um, thanks again for your attention and enjoy desserts and coffee now. And um, thank you so much. talking to my wife, we were walking on one of the trails, and I told her, I said, you know, I think this is going to be really important. We really need to do something or it's going to be gone. It was a brave vision. There were many, many obstacles. And from there, it blossomed into an organization that uh, has, has done a lot of good work for, uh, for the open space, and I think for, for children in general and the, and the population here on the hill and beyond. Part of the, the value of what we're doing is to protect a resource that benefits us now and will benefit our children and grandchildren in the future. The mission of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy is to preserve land and restore habitat for the education and enjoyment of all. Without restoration, we'll be losing some of the, the species like the California gnatcatcher and the cactus wren, and we also have a couple of butterflies that we restore for, the El Segundo blue butterfly and the Palos Verdes blue butterfly. There's something that resonates with me very deeply when I'm out in the open space. I find it very restorative. It's beautiful, the fresh air. I find it the best way to clear my mind. I try and walk every day on one of the preserves. It's the best possible way for me to start my day. When we first founded the Conservancy, the, we actually went to each of the cities on the peninsula, uh, gave a presentation to the city councils and said, uh, and I remember one particular case I gave, a, I was talking to the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council and one of the council members asked, uh, how much is it actually going to cost to acquire this property? The city manager actually answered the question <laughs> and said, it's going to cost millions. This is really, really expensive property. And so uh, the idea that we were actually going to acquire property and you know put it aside and pur purchase it, uh, I think was uh, something that people really didn't believe at the beginning. We've worked for the past 25 years to assemble 1,600 acres of open space and the vision is that so people can come and enjoy these scenic lands, moments of solitude, that they're safe and secure environments for our plant and animal communities and that they're here for all of our futures, our grandchildren and beyond. If we destroy it, which is easy enough to do, we don't know how to replace it. We can't remake uh, any of these creatures once they're gone. Starting in seventh grade, I started volunteering with the Conservancy, and since then I've been researching there on carbon sequestration capabilities of the native plants, and I've also been starting a butterfly restoration project for the Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly. I think when I was in middle school, I really just wanted to experience the environment and to get out and to learn about the native habitat, and I've gained such a great appreciation for the native environment. Since we began keeping regularly consistent records of volunteer hours about nine years ago, we've had over 80,000 hours volunteered to the organization, and over 50,000 of that is in habitat restoration. I'm the program manager for the third grade education program. And uh, what that involves is uh, training our docents. We have uh, 15 docents that uh, belong to our organization. Uh, we've been handling this uh, third grade program on the peninsula for uh, 18 years. And uh, I've been associated with it for the last 15 years plus. And uh, we've grown from uh, 10 schools on the peninsula to 23 schools now in the greater South Bay area. We average uh, every year about 2,000 kids now. One, one child, I remember, he, uh, uh, we were sampling the, uh, the fennel, the sweet fennel, and we, we tell the story about the Spaniards using fennel as part of their medicine chest, and it, it tastes like black licorice. He was not one to like black licorice, so he asked me where the red licorice plant was. <laughs> 
you know, there's still such a long way I can go and so much more that I, I need to um, experience, but this is definitely a foundation for what I can be pursuing in the future. Uh, local governments are extremely important in this and it's really a team effort. Uh, you know, an organization like ours, we basically can bring a lot of volunteers in to help, but the local governments, um, you know, they have a lot of other powers that a group like ours would never have, such as enforcement issues and things like that. So it is a partnership and it will always be. We have a commitment to our community, to ourselves, to uphold the conservation values of these lands. The conservation easements that we hold over these open spaces are written to run with the land in perpetuity. And that's a mighty long time. And that's why it's imperative that we, you know, that this 25th anniversary is an amazing celebration, but that there needs to be many more 25th anniversaries <laughs> in the future. <laughs> many, many more. Happy anniversary. Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, 25 years old, 2013. Happy 25th anniversary to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, and we thank the community for their enormous support in allowing this to happen. Happy 25th anniversary to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy. I'd like to wish a happy birthday to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy for 25 years of service on this peninsula and a happy 25th anniversary to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy and thanks for all the great work you've done. I want to wish the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy a happy 25th anniversary. Thank you.